Hi, we are at the end of 2020 and almost there with 2021. Uh, so today we have with us once again, Julian Fisher, founder and CEO of NA9 with a crystal ball in his hand so that we can have a peek into what the world will look like for cloud, for new Kubernetes and all those things. But before we go there, Julian, can you tell us a bit about what is NA9 all about? Well, we are basically leveraging open source software and making it consumable by large clients such as enterprise companies. So main focus is about building application developer platforms. Um, and we do have a strong focus on data service automation. Perfect. Now go grab your crystal ball and tell me what predictions do you have for 2021? Well, I think in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, a lot is evolving around the adoption of Cloud Foundry uh, to Kubernetes. Um, obviously that's uh, a game changer. Um, in earlier conversations, we looked at how natural it is for a Cloud Foundry to change the container orchestrator. But uh, the transition to Kubernetes has more magnitude than just um, changing the container orchestrator. It, um, it, the conversations we had, we also talked about how Kubernetes-based environments are different than uh, Cloud Foundry environments that are um, depending on the classic stack running on virtual machines. And we said that it is likely that Kubernetes environments uh, do not com consist of a large, um, large scale, a single large scale Kubernetes cluster, but instead there's a, a, a larger number of smaller clusters. And um, it becomes more obvious that this will also affect Cloud Foundry. So it, I think that we will see an adoption of Cloud Foundry uh, to fit into smaller environments. So if Kubernetes becomes the prime standard to um, provision infrastructure resources and Cloud Foundry is um, remaining the uh, dominant, dominant way to deploy applications on Kubernetes, especially in the context of large organizations, uh, then I would also assume that um, there will be more Cloud Foundry environments than we have seen in the past. So I can just tell from our experience, we do have environments where there are thousands of virtual machines. Um, so they, they are all comprised, uh, these virtual machines are all managed in a single uh, Cloud Foundry environment. I, I would assume that if we migrate those environments to, um, to Kubernetes, then uh, we'd also see that these large platforms will be uh, broken into pieces. Um, so splitting the Cloud Foundry comp control plane, for example, and also um, having separate or uh, several Kubernetes clusters um, instead of um, instead of a single one running multiple Cloud Foundry environments. So it is very likely that these large Cloud Foundry environments will be split into um, several smaller ones. Now, this obviously also creates a lot of challenges. Um, if, uh, for example, now an operational team is trained to, um, you know, handle Bosch deployments, and um, a Bosch deployment triggers the update of a single environment, if you split that environment into, let's say, a dozen smaller environments, and you still want to have the same operational mm -hmm. efficiencies, this will uh, naturally require your automation to um, compensate that additional effort that you will see when looking at several clusters instead of just a single one. Well, I do believe that um, the transition of classical Cloud Foundry environments to Kubernetes-based environments is still one of the leading questions of Cloud Foundry folks. And um, that's about timing, when it is the right timing to do so, and what is the anticipated change in our operational best practices is uh, our questions that many uh, Cloud Foundry people will may, may ask. So uh, covering the first bit, the Cloud Foundry environments may break into smaller clusters, uh, which raises the bar for the automation necessary to keep the operational efficiencies up, which is one of our research, um, uh, which is our research focus in the Cloud Foundry area for 2021. Yeah, so when it comes to Kubernetes itself, um, I mean, there was a, a change in um, that 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 actually got a lot of attention, which was about um, being uh, that 
Docker being deprecated as the underlying container uh, service for Kubernetes. I personally believe that um, what happens to Docker is what happened to operating systems a while ago, is that they just, they are not what people are, are focusing on. They expect a container service to be there as it is the foundation of a, a container orchestration platform. But in the end, it doesn't really matter which one it is. So deprecating the Docker interface to me, it doesn't appear to be a big deal as long as uh, a developer's um, uh, software engineering pipelines, the CI CD pipelines that will trigger the deployments, create the container images and that, all that. If that remains working, I think that's a transition that will go on smoothly. So um, in the field of um, application developer platforms, we've been looking so far at, uh, at Cloud Foundry, seeing the changes happening in the Cloud Foundry ecosystem. We briefly touched um, Kubernetes, which uh, leaves us to the last of the three building blocks that every application developer platform has, which is a data service automation. So it is clearly uh, the case that Kubernetes also affects data service automation. We've been talking about that in prior conversations, and uh, I think it, um, it remains a valid assumption that uh, Kubernetes um, cannibalizes to some degree uh, infrastructure APIs and is perceived as a a uh, unified way of, of talking uh, to infrastructures. And um, with the concepts of stateful sets, um, Kubernetes nowadays provides, um, let's say, natural structures to express life cycle of uh, stateful workloads. We've pointed out that there are still, that there are still open issues, uh, especially um, when it comes to container isolation, but I think that's also a matter of time until these um, issues of being fixed. Um, what um, the automation of data services in the area of Kubernetes, um, well, let's say naturally will, or what, what there will be an, an, an area of interest, at least in, in our perception, is uh, the, emerge, the emerge of technology such as the chaos mesh, uh, a service mesh that uh, can be used to simulate network failures. So uh, at any nines, we've been engineering uh, automation to make data service highly available, including a self-healing um, and scaling capabilities of clustered instances. Now, for example, if you take a Postgres cluster using asynchronous streaming replication, you also have to take care of failure detection, leader election in the event of network segmentations. Um, not always you will see uh, simple failure scenarios such as stop fail where a virtual machine, for example, fails, um, is gone and remains gone. Uh, instead, you may see uh, flapping networks, fluctuation in bandwidth and latency. Often um, these situations are uh, transient, are volatile, they are hard to reproduce, they happen somewhere in the night and um, they may cause um, clusters to go into uh, degraded mode, into failure state. They may, they may break clusters and nobody really knows how to deal with them. So in, in our perception, uh, dealing with network edge cases is part of lifecycle management because uh, in our experience of uh, nearly 20 years running operational workloads on behalf of clients is that everything that fails, uh, that is possible to fail will eventually fail including networks and uh, ambivalent uh, problems in networks such as uh, fluctuation and, and so on of, of various factors such as latency and bandwidth. So by having a tool set such as Chaos Mesh to be able to simulate these failures effectively and reproduce it in a reproducible manner and in a way that it can be easily described, I think this will also boost um, the automation of data service life cycles. So we've recently started to um, increase the automation and test depth of our data services. And we are planning to have uh, first releases of Any9's Postgres for Kubernetes at the end of uh, quarter one in 2021. So I would assume that other data service vendors will follow that path um, as well. And um, therefore I would say that um, Kubernetes will also change uh, the way data services are being automated. What do you think is going to be the focus of any nines in 2021? 
there's a lot going on with Kubernetes that will take the attention of uh, our product development teams focusing on, on building new products. But um, a majority of the company will remain um, uh, pushing forward the boundaries of data service automation on virtual machines as well. Um, we are also pushing forward uh, and increasing the automation degree of automation of the classical Cloud Foundry stack, as we believe this will be the stack um, to operate large scale application workloads for a while. It uh, it would be um, it is ambitious uh, to migrate uh, large platforms to Kubernetes based infrastructures, and uh, we assume that 2021 will be too early for let's say the um, the extreme larger end of the spectrum. Small environments, yes, large environments, we don't think so. So therefore, uh, keeping the systems, the classic system stable, pushing forward automation to reduce uh, operational friction uh, and simultaneously uh, pushing new products uh, based on Kubernetes with um, a different, a, a slightly different uh, market segment in mind. I do believe that the Kubernetes products will attract uh, companies that can be smaller because the environments can be smaller. They will come with um, decreased uh, infrastructure footprint. So um, they will just be um, more cost effective than the classic counterparts when it comes to uh, the entry level. So if you have a large scale application development platform, classic uh, infrastructure, classic Cloud Foundry, for example, on VMs will be fine. Same for data service automation. But if you are looking at a lot of smaller environments, for example, because you use these environments for tenant isolation, I think the Kubernetes-based um, Anynine's platform modules will be very interesting. And uh, in 2021, we are going to release um, these modules in, uh, in closed beta programs. Julian, thank you so much, not only for sharing these predictions with us, but also telling us, you know, what is going to be the focus of the ninth in 2021. Uh, once again, thank you for your time, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you. And you're very welcome. And I'm also looking forward to speaking to you again. Um, so hopefully it, will, it won't be too much long until then.